Good afternoon. This is Guillermo Sabatier, your host for uh, today's uh, episode of Perspectives on Energy. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, grid reliability concerns when it comes to installing solar, wind, and how that uh, can pose a risk to the grid, to the overall electric grid. Earlier this, this week, I, I was listening to a podcast on the NRECA, which is the National Rural Electrical Co-ops Administration, right? And, and one of the things that they were definitely um, discussing was the fact that uh, raising the alarm uh, specifically for uh, electric co-ops that from gener generally their size aren't as large as most uh, investor-owned utilities. So one of the things that they're concerned with, right, is that as these uh, as the industry commissions a growing number of utility scale solar and wind projects, these larger entities, right, have the ability to manage and absorb and mitigate, right, that that uh, output variability or right, intermittency that you see in those resources. Uh, and again, it's it's usually they they are installing those resources to pretty much. Uh, replace the premature or forced uh, retirement of some of these older coal or even uh, fossil fuel uh, base load plants. Uh, they still manage to have some other re resources that they can redispatch to accommodate that variability. But when it comes to uh, co-ops, that's not quite as simple or as easy. And for the most part, a lot of co-ops are forced to buy power from these larger utilities because they don't have a lot of the uh, same generating resources. Uh, that are available, dispatchable, or even part of the portfolio. A lot of times these co-ops aren't even power generators, right? They're just, they may own transmission, they own distribution. And that is pretty much all they are. So in a lot of cases, now they're subject to the availability of uh, resources out of these larger utilities that are generator operators, balancing authorities, or generator owners. So um, again, uh, they are definitely raising the alarm. Uh, they are seeing challenges coming up. And, and we'll break it down today into maybe a set of five different segments as to why or how we can best describe this, right? So number one, you know, we're looking at the more, the grid essentially has become more fragile. It's a lot less reliable. And there's a number of reasons for that. So that's number one. Uh, and why is that, right? Number two, part of that is the disorderly energy transition, right? We all agree we need to proceed with the energy transition. Problem is we've been doing it in a disorderly fashion. A lot of that comes into the in a form of uh, premature or early retirement of uh, generating units that are well within their useful life. So now this asset, will, for whatever reason, we'll discuss that a little further. So uh, number three, there's a lot more demand. We have a, a really, which is great, right, for, for the industry. Uh, in a way, but at the same time, there, there isn't the infrastructure in place to supply that demand. There's a lot greater level of electrification, uh, not just in residential, but also industrial, commercial, agriculture, for example, manufacturing, a, a lot more demand that just simply is uh, we're having trouble meeting in this case, right? Um, the other interesting thing that we see here, right, is um, There's number four, there's really no government agency that is in charge, solely in charge of grid, grid reliability. You have FERC, you have NERC, you have the Department of Energy, but they're not really in charge of re reliability, right? And that's something that we they they have pointed out time and time again to see, you know, where does the buck stop, right, in that case. So we will discuss that a little bit. Um, the last one, of course, is five, is, is that the U.S. alone cannot change the uh, the climate of the environment, right? Uh, while we work really hard and do a great job at, at this transition, uh, many other countries are not doing that. And in fact, they're putting more of these carbon emitting uh, resources online. And uh, they, they did plenty last year and they're gonna continue to do so. And some of these emerging economies uh, all throughout the world are doing the same. So we'll discuss that as well. All right. So let's uh, go back to the first one, right? The, we are, our grid is more fragile, less reliable. And there, there, have, there was one example of, of the effects of that. Uh, we had those uh, winter storms back in uh, Christmas Eve of 2022, where you had eight different utilities in the mid-Atlantic states doing rotating blackouts, uh, feeder rotation, brownouts, and simply because they just uh, did not have the uh, generation to meet the, the demand of the load. So that in itself presents a problem, but it's a clear evidence of what's happening regarding um, our generating resources and having that, uh, that, that, that ability to supply base load 
in the face of this viable uh, renewable resources, you know, which in a lot of cases are not sufficient during these peak or winter months, right? They tend to do better in the summer, but they don't do quite as well in the winter. Um, a lot of that has to do with the fact that, um, and even NERC itself, right? Ish, they, they do seasonal studies. So NERC is the National Electric Reliability Corporation. And, and again, they are an, an industry entity, which they are have, have a delegation from the FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which you know they are uh, basically uh, applying reliability standards, but ultimately they are not the government agency that's in charge of maintaining reliability. NERC does a great job, right? But again, it's it's a it's a it's a uh, industry organization. Yeah. So one of the things that they've been, um, I guess, uh, well, one of the things that they always report on, uh, they do capacity assessments. They every year they do one for the winter, they do one for the summer. That's usually when you have your peaks. And one of the things that they are they pointed out is the fact that we are we are we are really they've seen like a really steady downward trend in grid reliability. And that's been going on for the last few years. A lot of that has to do with, with this disorderly uh, deployment of renewable resources, right? So, and it's going to be concerning, especially as we enter the, the we're, we're already in the summer months uh, here in 2023, and we're already starting to experience near misses or, or really approaching the, I mean, we're not even at the, at the peak summer months yet. And we've had a few issues already with the, energy emergency alerts in some parts of the country. So that is coming and it's it's bound to get a little worse. Um, so tying into that, of course, is uh, the, this this orderly energy transition. That's that's uh, point number two, right? It's the, it's the premature retirement of base load generating assets, right? Or in other words, some folks call it the disorderly energy transition. And that usually involves just replacing reliable, uh, dependable, uh, dispatchable, Based on generation with a uh, with these uh, intermittent variable resources that are great, right? They're 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 renewable. They uh, they don't have any emissions. However, they are not as reliable as some of these resources. So when it comes to actually the having uh, availability of these resources, I mean they they could be available twenty four seven all year. Uh, these renewables are not. And they're often built and as available rather than dispatchable some, some of these resources. And what's happened, of course, we understand, right? They, they've targeted a lot of these coal resource coal generators, uh, but some of these coal generators were less than five years old, but where the state would, whether it was by economic reasons, uh, policy, political pressure, or a or number of, of other drivers, you know, they were retired early, uh, way before the end of their useful life. So, so again, they, the, some of these, you know, they gasified them, turned them to burn natural gas. That's, of course, not their optimal mode of operation. That's not their optimal efficiency point. Uh, a couple of examples are some of these, like, uh, coal burning plants can produce 800 megawatts a piece, but when they go ahead and burn natural gas in them, and again, that, that's quite a process to go ahead and, like, retrofit that to burn gas. You end up with the challenge of um, you lose like maybe 20, 25 percent of that output. The unit usually becomes a 600 megawatt unit in that case. So uh, that's one problem, right? And then, of course, the other issue naturally is is even in the these winter months that we saw uh, last year, uh, we also notice a problem where even when you have these like um, combined cycle plants or all these natural gas burning generators, uh, getting the supply of gas to those sites was becoming a problem. You had some of these like uh, co-ops and uh, other small utilities that did have generating assets and they had a uh, a firm gas contract with these pipelines that essentially they gas wasn't delivered, gas wasn't available. There was a lot of demand for gas out throughout the residential sector that uh, and commercial perhaps where the, the industrial contracts, were, they were not able to meet. So that presents a problem. So now you don't have enough fuel to run some of these generators to some of these generators. So you're looking at another problem with having assets. So so it, it's, and that part of that was was the forced closing of some of these pipelines. So again, um, don't want to rely entirely on fossil fuel, but we also need to have, uh, everything should be part of a mix. Uh, and, and, and over time, right, that should be a very you know, measured, careful approach to how we make this transition. Uh, 
rather than proceed ahead at any cost, which of course ultimately puts us at risk from unreliability. And it also is greatly, greatly um, makes our operating costs out of control. So because that, and that of course will affect uh, everything uh, from the from economics all the way down to the consumer itself, themselves when they're trying to buy power. Right? Um, another thing to understand, right? Pretty much everything right now is pretty hard to build, right? Uh, one of the other things that they were discussing was uh, the fact that building transmission. So, so yeah, say you have a lot of these renewable resources in certain key places, you still have to get this power to the load centers. You got to get this power as a wheel, uh, wheeled over uh, through transmission lines. So right now, as, as it stands, we don't have adequate transmission uh, reliability, transmission infrastructure to be able to move all this new power to all this new demand. So getting getting a transmission project permitted and and and, and a commission then all that takes uh, there's one project right now at in the um, cardinal hickory in the northwest of the country which is a one gigawatt project that thing is, is has been going on since 2014 and right now it is still in the permitting process so that, that just gives you an idea of how long this could take um and again it, perhaps uh, some permitting reform would greatly benefit right this uh this whole process but uh, building a lot of transmission alone, I mean, you they would have to show us the data and see how that would actually work and in what time frame, uh, what would be the timeline to build all of these transmission assets that would be adequate to meet this growing demand for energy, or at the same time, you know, trying to figure out how to, how to use the existing reliable dispatchable resources that we have left while mixing in with these uh, intermittent renewable resources, right? The definite challenge in this case. And the other issue, of course, is um, right, so they're they're saying replace a lot of these with batteries or augment a lot of these with batteries. Well, right now most batteries only last about four hours, you know, given a discharge. And some of those storms, specifically those winter storms, right? They they uh, you you had that go on for at least four four five six eight days. So there is no way you're gonna you're going to be able to rely on these batteries to alone to be able to like make up for this like a uh, base load uh, dispatchability it's uh, right now it's not it's just not possible at this time given the cost given the supply chain given availability and um and uh, of course it's it's also sourcing all these things and getting them built on time so uh one of the other issues you got to remember too is that is that any uh the utility industry is very capital intensive right so for them uh the decisions are are it's it's a long-term decision a long-term project so planning all these out usually requires a uh, careful cost analysis and 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 has to make sense financially right you're not going to build uh rely rely mostly on all experimental or, or new technology especially when that technology is costing you a lot to produce so you, and uh, all that uh, energy cost eventually ends up being passed down to the consumer which of course is going to impact everybody's pockets in the negative ways so, um so going back to what i was saying here so now number three point number three is more demand so yes, we are seeing a uh, a lot more electrification um, from cooking in the kitchens to uh, vehicles to, but then also in industry, we're seeing a, a big departure away from fossil fuels, uh, spe specifically in industrial processes toward electrification. Right. One example, for example, is agriculture, where they're no longer using diesel to to run a lot of their equipment and they're moving over to electric well uh, we have a pretty big agricultural industry so in this case that presents another yet added piece of demand and load on the grid so just one example so as we make this transition and build right we're going to see a lot more demand so our so problem is the challenge here is being able to meet this demand with our current uh, generation portfolio in our mix so it's not always easy to be able to meet that given 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 the way we're growing so the other challenge here that, that i've seen is uh, let's go back to the regulation right so government agencies so right now there's no NERC has responsibility for it, but they're not really in charge of reliability, right? Something has been delegated to them by, by FERC, which has gone in from the Department of Energy. But then again, NERC is an industry and it's the entity. So, um, and, and, and I can assure you, right, the EPA, 
it's not thinking their focus isn't reliability when they are making policies so that's another thing right so where is grid reliability being looked at as a policy and and of course that becomes a national security policy we are uh, at a point where we are putting ourselves in in a in a rather precarious uh, condition by doing what we're doing now granted um that brings me to point number five right uh the u.s alone cannot change the climate uh, we're looking at um we're doing a great job of making this transition and we're making a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of uh, innovation when it comes to this and a lot of investments problem is that uh a large part of the world i mean we're not the only ones that that are taking this on but uh a lot of others are not joining us and they are in fact building and commissioning uh fossil fuel plants, some of them coal, brand new coal plants. Uh, China is one example, uh, India is another, and there's quite a few others that, that are also building these resources. And you're not going to get any of them that would build them anytime soon that, that recently built to go ahead and decommission them because they are available, they're reliable, they're inexpensive, and uh, they have a lot of life left in that, uh, that asset use for life. So they're not going to decommission those in exchange for re renewable resources. And they've all already made that investment. So they want to get the return on that investment. The other thing is, of course, is that, you know, they, they are able to mine their own, uh, their own source of fuel, which is another interesting challenge. Now, China right now, of course, is importing a lot of that coal from other places, but they still have the capacity to mine their own. Um, uh, Latin America is another example where they are also engaging in the same thing. Uh, Africa, of course, India, they're all doing quite a bit of that uh, type of um, fuel source for their uh, energy needs, which, you know, at the same time, they, they are, in fact, some of them are, are commissioning more coal plants than we are decommissioning. So that is a concern, right? So, so there's something needs to be looked at as far as what they are going to be offered as technology that's cost effective and reliable and at the same time it's dispatchable and then you know doesn't have uh also have this uh effect on the environment by uh, by having carbon emissions so again uh this is something that uh as a as a nation here for example impacts our national security when you think about it when you discuss uh re reliability okay. um that's another the and and, and so how do we address this issue, right? So, so at this time, right? The, and I've spoken about this at, at, at nauseum in some cases about small modular reactors. And the truth is, right, that the earliest we may see an SMR commission and put online and, and, and be commercially available will be probably 2029 if we don't have any delays. Um, the, if, you told, if the government says, hey, let's build 20 nuclear power plants at this time, large facilities, if they if they say like start right now to build them they probably wouldn't be ready until maybe 13 years from now so and that's that's the other challenge there right so it takes a long time to turn these around and uh 2035 more than likely will be the time when you see those those, those commissions so uh the, quite a timeline to, to build those and and we're not quite getting closer to, to doing that so transmission is another problem as well right? but, but commissioning and new transmission facilities takes quite a bit of time as well so those aren't as easy to build either if I, I in if, in my experience I've seen those be a little bit more difficult to actually site build and uh, be able to uh, get all the easements get all the right of ways to be able to build those facilities than you need for a, uh, a generating plant so quite quite a different thing but quite a different challenge in that regard and and I just don't see it. Show me the data where where you'll be able to build all of this transmission, have that have all that transmission reliably and stably, and 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 economically move all this power from all these all these sources to all these loads, or where they would sink. So that, that's another problem. Uh, a lot of times I hear batteries, right? Batteries would be the answer to all these problems, but usually those those suggestions don't come from people that are uh, very well experienced in the industry. So how do you reliably uh, deploy these batteries? Mind you, it's, most of them only run for about four hours and you have to recharge them. Um, so let's think of supply chain. If you decide to actually acquire a large amounts of these batteries, right? Well, where are you gonna get them from, right? You're gonna source them out of China or you're gonna try and build them domestically. Uh, again, that's another problem was how, how long would it take to actually have them built? And let's not forget how much they cost, right? They're not exactly the cheapest thing out there. 
And uh, where do you install them? I mean, where will you place them in your system to be able to support your voltage and support your, your uh, energy needs, right? Um, and the last thing I want to point out here right, is the fact that, that, is that I'm not denying that this whole climate change uh, problem is real. It's happening. We need to address it. But this transition needs to be done in an orderly fashion and carefully because we're we are inching ourselves closer and closer to a severe um, putting ourselves in a very risky position when it comes to grid reliability over the next two or three years. Um, and, and for me, uh, I, I sometimes worry about how how we're, we're doing this. And I often wonder right now, as far as policymakers or as far as as far as anyone that's really pushing pushing an agenda towards towards moving us towards this energy transition, are they only concerned with just this source of energy, or are they looking at grid reliability as a whole, or that, are they even looking at grid, or is that something that, you know that that they're not concerned with whatsoever because you know they just don't know. But in a lot of cases, right? I mean, when it comes to the industry, the electric utility industry, we're very energy agnostic, right? And when I say we, because I was part of that for 30 years. So we don't care where we get the energy from. All we want to do is perform, perform reliably, perf uh, be available, be dispatchable, uh, uh, economic. And then of course, you know, now that the new requirement, hey, to be uh, uh, low emission or emission free. So for us, it does not matter where we get it from. It does, uh, so we don't care what the source will be as long as it's reliable and it meets those uh, requirements that I discussed. So in that case, right, um, I would really hope to see some some innovation happen in the next uh, three or four years. Um, right now, it's the best transition we could see is is converting some of these coal, coal or oil or anything else that burns fossil fuels that could be maybe converted over natural gas at some point. And uh, that'll be a transition that could be that could run for a good five, 10 years. And then eventually as SMRs are ready or other resources are ready, we can use that to replace that uh, fossil fuel base load generation that's reliable. And uh, that would be something that I think we might be able to get there. But again, it's going to be a while before we see those first SMRs come online and be commercially available. All right. So uh, if you have any comments, questions, uh, go ahead and place them in the comments below. I'll, I'll try and reach out to respond to them and follow up uh, either way. Uh, when it comes to all these like challenges, of course, for the operator, uh, there's uh, quite a bit of training happening that needs to happen, right, for a lot of these uh, both operators, but more importantly, some of these policymakers. Uh, I think I've noticed that that, that usually um, anytime you're, you're looking at changing uh, environmental policy or or using some kind of um, legislative vehicle, especially legislators, probably need to have a little bit more education as far as how the grid would work and how the science behind uh, grid reliability is uh, is implemented. And, and that's something that we at HSI pride ourselves in having the training material, the expertise, the SMEs to be able to deliver that. Uh, to anyone that needs it. And in this case, I think some of these legislators will probably benefit from having a little bit more knowledge uh, as far as uh, what their decisions do and how they impact reliability. Mm -hmm. And uh, we understand that, that getting to a, a carbon-free future is very important and we'll support you and walk, walk with you along the way. And we want to help everyone get there because, because we're part of this. But at the same time, let's make sure we get there reliably and we do this in an orderly fashion. So. Anyway, that's all I have for, for today. Um, again, leave any comments. I'll try and respond as soon as I can. And um, thank you again for uh, watching. Talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.